It is a belief to which Christians of all denominations subscribe without in any way prejudicing their own church membership. You must have heard of the lost ten tribes of Israel. Well, we found them. They're us. We can show that our Celto-Saxon ancestors, together with the peoples of Scandinavia, Denmark and Holland, originated in the Bible land, which used to be called Palestine, but now the world calls it Israel. Between the 8th and 6th centuries BC, the Old Testament nation of Israel went into captivity in Assyria, Media and Babylonia, which is today's northern Iraq and the Persian Gulf area. However, they didn't stay there long. After many centuries during which Israel migrated northwestwards through Asia Minor and into Europe, they finally arrived in these islands in successive waves of Saxon, Vikings, Danes and Jutes. And finally, the Northmen or Normans who landed at Pevensey in Sussex. According to Sir Arthur Keith and other well-known ethnologists, way back in time, they were all originally one family, but known by several different names. Let's travel back in time, 4,000 years, as far back into BC as we are into AD. To a man called Abraham, whom God called out from his comfortable lifestyle in Ur of the Chaldees, to a new home in Palestine, which was then called Canaan. God chose him to become the father of a very special nation, chosen to serve God's purposes here on earth. Now Abraham has a son, Isaac, who in his turn has a son, Jacob. And Jacob's name is changed by divine decree to Israel. Israel raises a great clan of 12 sons, destined to become the nucleus of God's servant nation, which, if they follow God's laws, given to Moses on Mount Sinai, is to provide an example to other nations of a people totally in tune with the Almighty. But there is famine in Canaan, and Israel's family is forced to move south into Egypt to live. There they stay, a captive workforce, for 430 years, serving the various pharaohs as slaves. And, despite increasingly harsh treatment, become a very sizable people. Indeed, some millions. Finally, God appoints Moses, a somewhat unwilling leader, to bring Israel out of Egypt. So God parts the Red Sea, and Israel escapes from the pursuing Egyptian army which is swamped by the returning waters. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, during which time the faint-hearted ones die out, only the young and strong, desert-hardened, enter Palestine. At first, following the divine law, Israel becomes the richest and most powerful nation in the Middle East. But all too soon, and despite the warnings from Israel's wise men, they forsake the law, and many adopt the obscene practices of Astarte and Dagon, the evil gods of the coast. The ultimate horror of civil war casts a black shadow over this once great nation, and it seems that God's special nation has failed him. It has gone its own way, forsaking the law and the prophet's warnings come true. And in successive waves of captivities, Israel is removed from Palestine, their homeland, and the world forgets them. They become lost, but not to God. With the fall of the Assyrian capital Nineveh in 612 BC, Israel starts on a long, slow migration toward the northwest through the Caucasus Mountains where the main pass is still called the Pass of the Israelites. 
And over the ensuing thousand years, they become known by many different names. Urged on westward by attacks from the aggressive Sarmatians from the east, they finally arrive on the shores of the Baltic and the North Sea, where the Romans call them Cumbri. Israel has been following the setting sun westwards. Then, in wave after wave of invaders, they cross over to these isles between the 4th century BC and the 11th century AD. Israel has finally arrived in this green and pleasant land, but only a select few know who they really are. Accepting the surrender of a Spanish galleon, Sir Francis Drake was one of those who knew we were Israel, so calling us that in one of his written prayers. But if Israel is to serve the Creator's special purposes, she must be kept safe from the unwelcome attentions of continental tyrants and the envy of less happier lands. Flavit et dissipati sunt. He blew and they were scattered, wrote Queen Elizabeth I after the destruction of the Spanish Armada in 1588. The galleons being driven ashore by a great gale around the rocky coasts of Scotland and Ireland. Her words are engraved on the Armada Memorial on Plymouth Hoe. And also on a silver medallion she had cast to commemorate God's protecting hand. Then there was this extraordinary calm sea in the English Channel at the time of the evacuation of our armies at Dunkirk in 1940. Enabling the Royal Navy to rescue some 338,000 British and Allied troops from the encircling Nazis. Now, it's called the Miracle of Dunkirk. The prophetic vision of Britain's designers in the 1930s provided the Royal Air Force with efficient fighter aircraft just in time to thwart Hitler's planned invasion of England. God promised Israel that in the far distant future she would inhabit islands to the northwest of Palestine and be preserved from invasion by enemy forces. To spread abroad in the world and colonize. To become a nation and a company of nations with an enduring royal throne. They would spread the Christian gospel. They would free the slaves and they would have a great daughter nation, the United States of America. Surely, anyone with an unbiased mind can see that the promises made by God to ancient Israel of the Old Testament can only apply to Britain and its kindred Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples. Not to the Jews and not to the Israelis and not the church the clues all point in one direction, to us. But what of personal salvation? This is as necessary for one of Israel as for any other. But nationally, Israel was charged with the responsibility of distributing the gospel far and wide. 93% of all Christian missionary work has been done by the Christian West. Britain and America, with other like-minded nations, fulfill the ancient promises, the waymarks of Israel, and God's promises cannot be broken. Thus, we look forward to a cleansed and righteous nation, living in harmony with God's divine law, with Jesus Christ as King, returned to us, and ruling a restored Israel and a restored world. The Kentish Weald, with golden sunlight glinting through the trees. The English village garden and the hum of wandering bees. 
the springy turf of Wiltshire Downs with trilling lark on high, the age-old signs, the lonely mounds where Celtic chieftains lie. Cut without hands this sceptered isle, selected for a plan to serve a cause, fulfill a need destined since time began. A land so free from the enemy was Israel's future destiny. No wonder so many tourists come to Britain. A country mercifully free from the horrors of invasion and occupation, so frequent a happening on the continent of Europe. Certainly the Romans came, they occupied, but they never wholly conquered, and finally they departed. As a reminder of the Roman occupation, the head of the Emperor Hadrian dredged out from the bottom of the Thames near London Bridge. William of Normandy came and conquered. But the Normans were of the same stock as the Anglo-Saxons, and bit by bit they integrated with the population. Certainly with some opposition, but now it's a matter of pride to be able to say, my people came over with a conqueror. Time and time again throughout the history of these islands, the country has been preserved from invasion by what can only be described as supernatural happenings. 400 years ago, the Spanish Armada, the most powerful fleet ever assembled, was heading up the English Channel with the ultimate object of invading England to bring the English Queen under the jurisdiction of Rome by force, with little to stop it, but the English fleet under the command of Lord Howard of Effingham. He could do little but snap at the heels of the Spaniards but they did quite a bit of damage, as they could sail twice as fast as the unseaworthy galleons and could fire four shots to their one. At Calais, Drake drifted fire ships down onto the Spanish fleet as they lay at anchor, and the Spaniards, in panic, cut their cables and scattered northwards into the unfriendly arms of the North Sea and into a sharp gale. Here the hand of Almighty God took over, and of a fleet of 149 ships, only 50 battered remnants regained their home ports after a hazardous circuit round the north of Scotland and Ireland, where some were not only wrecked, but plundered. Queen Elizabeth was evidently in no doubt about the miraculous aspect of this event, and she had struck gold and silver medallions to commemorate the occasion. These medals can be seen in the British Museum. The silver medallion has inscribed on one side of it, I am assailed, but not injured. And on the other side in Latin, Flavit et dissipati sunt. He blew, and they were scattered. A great memorial stands high on Plymouth Hoe, a reminder to us of God's protecting and sheltering hand. And on it is written the same theme, He blew, and they were scattered. And Sir Francis Drake stands nearby, still looking out over Plymouth Sound for a sight of the dawn. If it had not rained the night of the 17th, 18th June, the future of Europe would have been changed, was Victor Hugo's comment on the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon's crack troops were not, as one might have supposed, the guards, but the artillery. However, a heavy rainstorm the night before the battle had made a bog of much of the ground, and their guns were practically immobilized. 
Had Napoleon been able to bring his artillery to bear on the packed lines of British infantry, they would have been cut to pieces. In those days, one did not dig trenches or foxholes. One stood stiffly to attention and moved not a muscle as the heavy cannonballs came bounding along the ground like great cricket balls, but much more deadly owing to their intense kinetic energy. Divine intervention in the shape of a rainstorm, plus a little help from the Duke of Wellington, won the day. Although he wouldn't think so if he went to the battlefield today. French guides will go to some lengths to show that in fact it was the French who won the Battle of Waterloo. And there have been some strange stories from the Great War in which the enemy advance at a time of great crisis for the Allies was held up by the appearance of supernatural beings such as the White Cavalry and the Angels of Mons. Were all these troops hallucinating who reported these events? Many of the old contemptibles, as the British Army of 1914 was called, swore that they had seen these beings. And early in the war of 1939-45, another miracle, and it happened at Dunkirk on the French coast, when the British and Allied forces were surrounded by the victorious advancing German army. So familiar now, those long lines of British and Allied troops wading out to the ship, standing offshore. A flat calm in the channel, the like of which had not been recorded for 40 years, and it happened at the exact time when it was so badly needed, and you call it a coincidence? Such a calm made it easy for our vast fleet of little ships to put out from every harbour around the English coastline to rescue over 335,000 British and Allied troops when we thought, if we were lucky, we might perhaps rescue 30,000. Although there was this unusual calm in the Channel, inland over the continent there was very bad weather low cloud, rain and gale force winds which grounded the Luftwaffe. The Nazi general Halder was overheard saying, bad weather grounds our air forces and now we must stand by and watch countless of thousands of the enemy getting away right from under our noses. At this time of supreme crisis, King George VI came to the microphone to speak to the nation and said, we shall not ask that God may do our will, but that we may be enabled to do the will of God. And we dare to believe that God has used our nation and empire as an instrument for fulfilling his high purpose. On the 14th of July, 1940, Winston Churchill alerted the nation to the imminent danger of invasion with these words, now it has come to us to stand alone in the breach and face the worst that the tyrant's might and enmity can do. Bearing ourselves humbly before God, but conscious that we serve an unfolding purpose, we are ready to defend our native land against the invasion by which it is threatened. And we wait undismayed the impending assault Perhaps it will come tonight. Perhaps it will come next week. Perhaps it will never come. Although the Battle of Britain is now so well known and is often thought of as a great victory, in fact it was a very close run thing. We were down to our last reserves of fighter aircraft and more important, our last reserves of trained and experienced pilots. Our air crew losses had been considerable. A little time after Dunkirk, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, pictured here on the left with Douglas Bader, was asked by the Royal Air Force Chief of Staff, just what are your plans for defeating the Luftwaffe? Dowding's answer was brief and to the point. I believe in God. And then there's radar. On September the 15th, the day of the greatest mass assault by the Nazi air fleets, Douglas Bader said of the battle, It was the day when the Hurricane and Spitfire outfought the Luftwaffe and changed the course of history. And later, 
The fact remains that the Germans quit before we did, and so they lost. It's as simple as that. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the late Dr. William Temple, said on a Battle of Britain Sunday, Why has God preserved us? We may and we must believe that he who led our fathers in ways so strange and who has preserved our land in a manner so marvellous has a purpose for us to serve in the preparation of his perfect kingdom. We are blessed with a treasure to be used for the welfare of mankind. What is not so widely known, as it was happening far from the late summer skies of Kent and Sussex, was the grim game being played out in the cold and silent depths of the North Atlantic. This deadly war very nearly brought Britain to her knees. And indeed so serious was the situation, so many vital cargoes were being lost by mines and new boat attacks, that indeed it did bring Britain to her knees in the national days of prayer called by King George VI. So apprehensive was the nation at this time of grave crisis that there were queues three deep, hundreds of yards long, queuing to get into Westminster Abbey to cry to the Almighty for help. Is it to be fear that will bring this nation back to God? The immediate results of these national days of prayer was the rescue of Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain and in a speech by Sir Winston Churchill on the 31st of October, 1942, he said, I sometimes have a feeling of interference. I want to stress that. I have a feeling that some guiding hand has interfered. I have a feeling that we have a guardian because we have a great cause, and we shall have that guardian as long as we serve that cause faithfully. So now, let's look at this peculiar people who by rights should have capitulated over the past years time and time again to numerically superior forces, but didn't. To find the answer, we will have to track back through history 3,000 years. You may have seen in a previous slide program, Journey to Ultima Thule, a detailed survey of Israel's ancient history its decline, its invasions, and its eventual deportation from its own land, and its captivities in Assyria and Media. And when these powers waned, Israel's escape from slavery and its long migrations north and west across Europe to the shores of the North Sea and the Baltic, and finally into the British Isles. While yet in its original land of Palestine, Israel was told of its far distant future in the isles at the uttermost ends of the earth, where it would fulfill to a certain degree part of its God-given role. Stand back apart from the world and survey history. Survey the nations of the world and search for a nation which lives in islands and coastlands to the northwest of Palestine which has an enduring royal throne, which has outlasted so many of the continental royal houses, which has spread abroad to the west, east, north and south, in that order, which has colonized the desert places of the earth, which has taken the lead in spreading the Christian gospel and with its navy has fought constantly against the slave trade and has become a nation and a company of nations safe from invasion and the hand of war in her own beautiful land. Such was to be Israel's future. Any survey of history must confirm the fact that no people, no nation, has the identity marks foretold of the future Israel than the Celto-Saxon people of the West, and in particular those in the British Isles. Here is a chain of evidence leading toward the surprising possibility, indeed probability, that the so-called lost tribes of Israel were in fact never lost, but that over a long period of time they migrated right across Europe from southeast to northwest and into the British Isles wave after wave with different names, there to stand by, as it were, to mark time until as administrators 
they would have leaders call out to return to their own land of Palestine to govern that troubled area in justice and equity. Yes, their own land, incredible as it may sound, for the land of Palestine was given in perpetuity to the descendants of Jacob, the Hebrew, one of the progenitors of the nation of Israel, from whom we are descended. This is how it happened. One of the most sacred treasures of Israel, a talisman of priceless value, was a simple block of sandstone, which Abraham's grandson Jacob, later renamed Israel, set up for the memorial at Bethel in Palestine, where he had had a vision of a heavenly stairway reaching up to the stars. At the head of the stairway stood the Ancient of Days, who spoke and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And behold, I am with thee at all places whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. We, the Kelto Saxon West, are the lineal descendants of the northern house of Old Testament Israel, descended from Jacob, grandson of Abraham the Hebrew, the father of the nation. Palestine belongs neither to the Israeli nor to the Arab, but to Israel, the nation, of which great and ancient people, the Jews, some of whom are descended from the Old Testament tribe of Judah, are less than one twelfth part. The office of the chief rabbi in London confirms the above statement although we take issue with him on his third paragraph in which he states that dispersed northern Israel has been absorbed amongst the nations. Although a few may have been absorbed amongst the nations during Israel's long migrations, the vast majority arrived in these islands in successive waves over a long period of time and under different names. Like the rabbi, we also look forward to a regathering of all the clans of Israel at a future time. Now, let us imagine that a major crime has been committed, for example, a bank robbery. And then let us also suppose that the detective in charge of the case has in his possession a few clues, but many gaps remain in the evidence. Now, let us also suppose that the few clues which he does have all point in the same general direction. It is perfectly logical, therefore, to bridge those gaps, just as a graph line connects points on a graph, bridging those gaps. So then, let us examine the clues we do have concerning the whereabouts of Old Testament Israel. As we have seen, after the nation's calamitous end and its deportations from Palestine, an unseen force like the solar wind was urging Israel north and westwards following the setting sun until they arrived in successive waves in the isles at the uttermost end of the then known world. Dr. Moses Margulioth, a Jewish scholar of the 19th century, in his great work The History of the Jews, wrote, It may not be out of place to state that the isles are far off, mentioned in the 31st chapter of the book of Jeremiah were supposed by the ancients to be Britannia, Hibernia, and Scotia. And indeed the Scots, a hard-headed race indeed, informed us in the Scottish Declaration of Independence, signed in Arbroath Abbey in 1320, that their ancestors came from Scythia, one of the areas in which deported Israel had lived, and then later had continued their westward migration. Those of Israel who migrated north through Denmark and Norway, the Vikings, certainly caused the people of Britain some trouble. But strangely enough, for such a violent people, not long after King Alfred's great battles against the invaders, these Norsemen readily absorbed the Christian faith. This reconstruction of a Viking ship was recently sailed across the North Sea with a Danish crew on a more peaceful mission and she now stands on the clifftops near Ramsgate in Kent. Contrary to generally held belief, 
these waves of invaders of the Britannic Isles did not contribute towards a mixed or mongrel race. But according to Sir Arthur Keith and many other ethnologists of the highest order, men such as Professor Fleur, Dr. Roberts and Race and Sanger, the British and associated peoples are the least mixed of the nations who constitute the Caucasoid or European section of mankind. To those who will immediately accuse us of advocating racial superiority, the scriptures state emphatically the opposite, that Israel was chosen not as a sort of master race or heron book, but to serve God's purposes here on this planet. Indeed, in case the nation gets an exaggerated idea of its own importance, it is told, not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. So there's no favoritism there. Now, how may we recognize Israel, the Israel of today, the genuine Israel, not the Israelis? Will the real Israel please stand up? Do they possess any marks of identification? What do these mysterious people look like? Firstly, they were to live in islands and coastlands to the north and west of Palestine and so far from their original homeland that they were described as being at the uttermost ends of the ancient world, Ultima Thule. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Settled in these islands, Israel of the future was to be a maritime people and a colonizing nation, and even the order in which she gains her colonies is detailed. Israel was to lose her first colony, and the year 1788 saw the final decisive battle at Yorktown, Virginia, in which the British troops under Lord Cornwallis were defeated. Thus, Britain lost her first colony, an event foreseen and written about two and a half thousand years ago. But later on, we were to expand rapidly westwards, 3,000 miles across the American continent, as far as the Pacific Ocean, then east to the Indies, then north into the vastness of Canada, then south into Africa, India, Australia, and New Zealand. One of Israel's future tasks was to spread the message of Christianity to the well-meaning and evangelizing Victorians. The wish to carry the good news of the gospel was an overwhelming desire. And missionaries braved incredible hardships to do just that. 93% of the world's Christian missionary work has been done by the West, Denmark, Sweden, Britain, Holland, Norway, and America. Perhaps symbolic of Israel's caring for the more backward people of the world is this picture of the Norwegian actress Liv Ullmann with yet another helpless victim of the African famine. One of the sons of Jacob Israel, Manasseh, who settled on both sides of the Jordan River on the occupation of the land of Canaan, was told that he would become a great people. And indeed, the United States of America, who many believe to be descended from Manasseh, have become the richest and most powerful nation on earth today. The opening up of darkest Africa by the missionaries brought not only the Christian way of life as set out in the Bibles printed by the then new British and Foreign Bible Society, but this also paved the way for new roads, railways, the telegraph, schools, hospitals, and improved methods of agriculture. And towards the end of the 19th century, the British Navy played a major role in the unceasing war against the evils of the slave trade putting an end to much of this lucrative business. Slaving, however, brought in such profits that it remained a stain on the face of Britain until the 1890s. This graceful ship, the Lady of Avnel, was a slaver whose rotting hull lay in the mud of Poole Harbour until the 1950s when she was blown out of the water as she was a danger to navigation. The ship that died of shame 
After many years of trying to wake the conscience of the British nation, and many a long and heated argument in Parliament, William Wilberforce succeeded in 1833 in getting his anti-slavery bill through Parliament. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Who was the prophet Isaiah speaking to? He was primarily addressing Israel, the nation. The 19th century saw the start of several christian orientated movements, one of which was the Sunday School scheme, inaugurated by Robert Rakes, whose statue now stands on the Thames Embankment. Many a British pioneer, explorer, native administrator and missionary had cause to bless his old Sunday school for his unshakable Bible-backed beliefs. A sheet anchor in the face of some of the obscene black arts and witchcraft they sometimes had to face in the African hinterland. In the course of Britain's expansion, one might almost say unwilling expansion, as each and every new colony was an unwelcome burden on nation and parliament, the country, as we have seen, was to lose its first colony, Virginia. It would appear from Isaiah's writings that the people at some future time would find their new home too confining and would demand living room. The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. This is the English settlers' first parliamentary session at Jamestown a picture which hangs in the state capital at Richmond, Virginia. Then, later on, and rather unwillingly, Britain was to acquire an empire, which he was to administer with justice and fairness, contrary to today's critics of this country's role overseas. Later still, the empire was to evolve into that unique organization of freely grouped Commonwealth of Nations, bound together not by force, but by mutual respect and understanding. The parliamentarian Beverly Baxter, in reply to a storm of criticism by the left after Winston Churchill's speech in which he said that he had not become the King's first minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, said, those who see nothing but exploitation in the development of the British Empire are blind or jaundiced. They see only what they want to see. Generation after generation of officials, doctors, engineers, scientists, and missionaries have gone out from these islands to give their lives in bettering the living conditions of backward races. They have conquered famine, prevented plagues, irrigated the land, built roads and railways, tamed the jungle and harnessed the waterfalls. They have administered justice and taught respect for law, both ours and native. Unknown, Unhonored and unthanked, they have lived and died in far-off lands because it is in the blood of Britons to make green the desert and make straight the way. But, uh, says the critic, uh, Queen Victoria's colonial empire no longer exists. True, but this in no way makes null and void the scriptural prophecy. The Bible does not say that Israel's future grouping of nations was to last forever. It may last for a very long time, judging by past history, as, we believe, will the British royal throne. Westminster Abbey has seen the pomp and circumstance of many a royal wedding and coronation. But how strange it is that the kings and queens of England should be crowned seated in a somewhat ungainly wooden chair over a block of sandstone of no value whatsoever. Yet that piece of stone with rustless iron rings set in its sides, obviously for transporting, has an ancient and romantic history. This old engraving shows the last king of Israel, Zedekiah, captured by the invading Babylonians, and the royal dynasty of King David comes to an apparent end. Zedekiah is paraded before the king of Babylon, and his sons, the royal princes, are put to death in front of him. It's the last thing he ever sees. For he is blinded, as depicted in this somewhat gruesome woodcut from medieval days. But the Babylonians are evidently unaware that Israel alone among the nations of that day could secure the continuation of the royal line through the female.
and Zedekiah had daughters as well as sons, the Babylonians hadn't deigned to notice the little girls. Seeing the kingdom of Israel collapsing about their ears, senior officials at Zedekiah's court must have made plans to escape from Jerusalem, taking the royal princesses, then only children, with them. For the royal line must continue, if not in Palestine, then at all costs elsewhere. There is a mystical and symbolic reference to this event in the writings of the prophet Ezekiel, who speaks of a tender twig, the young royal princess, being cropped from the top of the cedar tree, that is, the royal line of Israel, and set in another land, but it would blossom and bear fruit. Under the guardianship of Jeremiah and Baruch, two senior members of the royal household, the little party leaves silently at daybreak and heads south for Egypt, along with the stone of Israel. For it is surely inconceivable that Jeremiah's officials would leave so vital a part of Israel's heritage to be desecrated by the Babylonians, should they realize its importance to their vanquished foes. It would be like leaving the crown jewels behind, had the Nazi invasion of Britain been successful in 1940, and had the British royal family left for Canada. Thus it is logical to assume that together with the royal children, Israel's stone of destiny would have been taken down to Egypt, presumably on some sort of wheeled vehicle, as it weighed about 400 weight. They were traveling down to the Egyptian border fortress at Tarpanes, where during the next few years, the princesses grew to adulthood, wards of the ruling pharaoh. Tarpanes, now known as Tel Daphne, was excavated in the 19th century by Sir Flinders Petrie, who found that the biblical record tallied remarkably well with his archaeological discoveries. It is interesting to note that the site had long since been called in Arabic El Qasar al Bintel Yehudi, the palace of the Jew's daughter. So evidently, the local tradition was that foreign royalty from Judah had long ago lived here. Though the evidence is gossamer thin, it is believed that the Stone of Destiny was loaded onto a ship in Egypt for its move toward the west, while the Babylonians were making threatening moves against Egypt, and indeed later attacked and overran Tarpanes. One of the ancient histories of Ireland, the Irish Annals, tells of a party of wise men and a great prophet who arrived in Ireland from the east, and they brought with them certain artifacts, one of which was a great stone, which the Irish called Leofoil, or Stone of Destiny. These Irish stories, although somewhat confused in their dating and much mixed with additional mythology, do appear to tell a cohesive story about an Eastern princess, believed to have been one of King Zedekiah's daughters named Scota, who intermarried with the line of Irish kings at Tara, and from which royal union eventually came our own Queen Elizabeth II. When in AD 600, Fergus Mac Irk II was invited to become ruler of a group of hitherto divided Scottish clans, he refused unless he could be crowned upon Leofoil. This is an early medieval drawing of a Scottish coronation on the hill at Scone. So Leofoil was sent for from Tara, and was taken north along the Irish highway, Schlie Milora, to the north coast of Antrim, to Dunseverick, thence by sea across to the island of Hye, or Iona, then to Dunstaffnage, then right across Scotland to Schoon in Perthshire. In 1296, King Edward I liberated the stone from Schoon and carted it south to London along with all the Scottish royal regalia. And although eventually the people of London agreed to let the Scottish regalia return to Scotland, they adamantly refused to part with the coronation stone. Thus it has remained, with one short break, when it was removed by a Scottish nationalist to Arbroath Abbey, beneath the coronation chair in Westminster Abbey. 
the same stone which the patriarch Jacob used as his pillow at Bethel in Palestine, and which later he set up as a memorial pillar. It became one of the most sacred treasures of Israel, a talisman of priceless value, carried with the nation wherever it went. At her coronation, Her Majesty the Queen is presented with the Holy Bible by the moderator of the Church of Scotland as the most precious thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. This is the coronation Bible, that most precious thing. And it has inscribed on the flyleaf the signatures of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. In Hatfield House, Hertfordshire, there is a great wall chart made for Queen Elizabeth I, in which her ancestry is traced back as far as King David of Israel. A noble pedigree indeed. This is the Golden Link. 3,000 years ago, the King David of Israel was chosen by God to bring the nation to the peak of its greatness. Today, Britain's royal house publicly accepts allegiance to Almighty God by receiving into its hands at the coronation service the Word of God. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. <laughs>